are filming interviews for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. And uh, my name is Dr. Michael Woods. My colleague is Monk Rowe. And today we're going to be interviewing and just conversing and relaxing, having a good time with Houston Person. We are very pleased to have you here and talk to you about your involvement in jazz. Well, I'm, I, I'm glad to be here, I think. I think you will be. <laughs> Uh, how old were you when you first started playing? And uh, what attracted you to the music? Um, well, I was about 18 or 19, but I'd always um, uh, been a listener of jazz through my friends, some of my friends introducing it to me and my neighbors, and um, hearing it on radio. And it just uh, attracted me, the creativeness of it. And um, my last year in high school, um, my father got me an instrument for um, Christmas. Uh, before that, I was involved mostly in sports. And we did have a piano in the home. Um, during that time, I guess, when I was coming along, everybody, every home had a piano. And my mother was a school teacher, and uh, she played the piano, so she taught me a piano at an early age, which I wasn't interested in. So I studied for about five or six months. And then um, that was real early. And then after that, um, much later, I got the saxophone. And um, that stuck. That stuck. So that's, yeah, about 17, 18, then I went on to college and really got involved in jazz. Did you go to the Hart School of, of, of Music? Mm, yes. Yeah. Yes, I went to uh, South Carolina State College first. Mm -hmm. I went there for three years, then I went into service, and then came back and went to uh -huh. Hart School of Music. So I was kind of a... A uh, school junkie during that time. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd stay in school forever. Was I correct in, in reading that, that during the military service you got to play with, with quite a few people that later on became good jazz musicians also? Oh, yeah. Well, they were great jazz musicians when I met them. Mm. Uh, Eddie Harris, uh, Cedar Walton, uh, Leo Wright, Don Menza. Uh, Don Menza. These guys were all great players then. I was just starting out. Mm -hmm. So they helped me a great deal in my early years, helping me get myself together and being very tolerant, of course. Um, they took me under their wings and mm -hmm. helped me a lot. In fact, the basis of my whole playing, um, my approach goes back to those guys. Um, and there was uh, Aaron Harvey, um, and Bobby Ephraim, my early uh, associations with them at South Carolina State and the South Carolina State College Band, which took me on and I didn't know a thing. They mm -hmm. just helped me along. Were you always a tenor player or were you? Yeah. Yeah. Always. I did study other instruments when I went to uh, the conservatory, but um, I stuck with the tenor saxophone. I just play that exclusively. You you talked about them helping you form your conception. How do you feel that your voice on the tenor is different from other tenor players and other uh, instrumentalists in general? Or what what uh, mm. what typifies your sound? What do you like? Uh, I like all types of music. Um, I grew up with rhythm and blues and country and western music. Who are some and, of your favorite uh, rhythm and blues artists? Uh, Roy Milton, uh, Amos Milvern, um, oh, Bull Moose Jackson. And they all use jazz players, so 
It wasn't such yeah. finely, de de finely drawn lines as they are now. Um, oh man, there were so many. Charles Brown. Mm -hmm. And most of these artists, you know, could be considered jazz artists also. Uh, the Ravens, the Dominoes, you know, all those uh, Sunny Tail and the Orioles. So it was, it was a lot of them, a lot of that type. Of course, then there was uh, uh, gospel music, which I was greatly influenced by. So it's a whole cross section of a lot of things. You know, basically, they say that the only difference between rhythm and blues and gospel is one guy's talking about God and the other one's talking about his girlfriend. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, Maybe some of those gospel groups you like. Uh, the Five Blind Boys. I love the Five Blind Boys. Uh, the Southern Airs. Gospel Southern Airs. Yeah. Um, some of the current ones, you know, James Cleveland. Uh, I'm mad about the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people out there that go unsung, you know, mm -hmm. that we don't hear mm -hmm. about. And I mean to a lot of those. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Tremaine Hawkins, oh, yes. who I think is one of the greatest singers regardless. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And, um, oh, the Wyans, so a lot of, you know, a lot of, and then a lot of them stay in the, in the gospel thing. Mm -hmm. They. Mm -hmm. And it turned on uh, what they considered to be more of a commercial success, success singing secular music, but they are truly a lot of integrity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you I know, admire that too. Yes, I wanted to say something about this because I think this is important. Is you know much of the music that is emanated from the African American community started in church in some capacity. Oh yeah, it all goes back to the church. You know, and uh, I still sense some of that in different forms, in the style, in the delivery style sometimes of, yeah. of the jazz artist. Oh yeah. It's the, the spirituality is still in there. Yeah. Um, and as far as you hear um, some of the great tenor players like Eleanor Jacket, Willis Jackson, and all those guys come along that they, they had that style, well, I guess you say honking. We call it honking, <laughs> but it's like a preacher preaching. Yeah. It sure is. It sure yeah, is. Yeah, so it's just a call and response. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> In fact, that, some of that's better than what's going on now, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, as far as getting the audience involved. Uh huh. The thing I always loved about gospel music, and I like to see it transfer into jazz, is the immediate. Uh, qualities and dynamic of its communication. In other words, when I listen to a, a, a guy on the Hammond B3 mm -hmm. behind the preacher after mm -hmm. he gets going, you know, the whole concept of thinking about music theory is completely secondary to its power to communicate immediately. Well, that's that's a trait in gospel and rhythm and blues, where in uh, and that's the approach I try to use. Uh, well, that's the approach I use because I know no other approach. It's emotion first, heart first. And whether it's wrong or not, uh, if you deliver it with authority, because um, when you listen to the preacher a lot of times, his grammar isn't out of Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the delivery, yeah. the delivery is there. And sometimes, well, it's not a critique of jazz. It's just that sometimes we don't involve the audience enough in, uh, because you just got to sit there. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, the way I remember, you know, my, my background, I shouldn't say the way I remember, but my background is people were dancing and it was more of a frolic and good time. 
and there was audience involvement. Then if you wanted to listen, you listen. If you wanted to dance, you dance. But dance is a part of jazz, which we've almost mm -hmm. taken out of it. Mm -hmm. Thus, we've lost a lot of listeners, too, mm -hmm. Right. that way. You know, in some West African societies, the word music and word dance are not separate. No, it's together. Well, every culture has a dance. Mm -hmm. I mean, regardless of, even the opera has the ballet, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and country music has square dancing. Mm -hmm. Line uh, dancing. Polkas have, Polish has the polkas. You know, so I, every culture has, has dance. Every culture has a dance associated with its music. Remember John so, Hurd trying to define jazz for us, and the only way he could describe it was, it was it's a dance. Yeah. Yep. But when you eliminate the elements, you lose some of the essence. Uh -huh. To me, that's just to me. Now there are parts of it where you, as in any culture too, where you have a music that you listen to. Like you go to the opera and you sit and you listen. Uh, but dance is still represented because somewhere you're going to have a ballet or some sort of dance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are other forms of music, uh, classical music, where you dance. Like the waltz. The waltz is a lot of fun to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. But a lot of people wouldn't listen to a waltz if they couldn't dance. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't listen to jazz because they can't dance. I had a guy ask me, just on the airplane, just coming over here, he said, uh, can you still dance to jazz? You know, <laughs> now, that's a heck of a question. I don't know that so you bad. could dance to some of the stuff Cecil Taylor does. <laughs> well, I'm saying that there are, there are elements of any music where you sit and listen. Yeah. Uh, there's a time for that. Uh-huh. And then there's a time, I mean, when you go to church. I was just going to mention listen, church. You listen and then, but if somebody, like we used to call it, when the spirit hits you and you feel like dancing, you just get up and dance. There and you had go. a lady that would dance every Sunday. Uh-huh, uh-huh. She it would just hit her and she'd feel so good. She'd just walk from one end of the church to the other. And yeah, it was almost like it was on cue because the <laughs> preacher would go into his, that call and response thing. Uh -huh. It's the same way as I was saying when the saxophone player used to go into the honking thing uh -huh. with the jazz artist. It's almost the same thing. And you know, sometimes when the preacher, when he says something that he knows is good, and he don't get the response he wants. He says, oh, y'all didn't hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. See, that? he changes the grammar. He changes the inflection of it. Uh -huh. It's a whole change of everything. Uh -huh. And it's, uh, it's almost the qualities that, that we don't have in political speakers now. Uh -huh. It's like, uh, I think the only guy that I could say could really do that now would be Jesse Jackson. Yeah. Uh, Martin Luther King had it. Mm -hmm. He sure did. And some of the great orators passed. I had I bought, I bought a book of speeches. Uh, but these were just great speakers up to the 60s. And they all had that fire. You know, you, you go back to uh, some of the Roosevelt speeches, uh, uh, Churchill, Winston Churchill, where they could speak to God, to the guy on the lowest level and to the person on the highest level. And they had that ability to change vocabularies, to change words, and use inflections that would influence either crowd. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And a musician has to do that too, in a certain sense, by learning to read his audience. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And sometimes your audience is deceptive. You, you, get, you know, you get a bunch of people in tuxedos, and you, 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 you gear your music to a certain way, and that's not really what they want to hear. They want to be saying they want to get down. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, you, you get another group of people who are just look like your average everyday worker and they, they want to hear something a little above them. So sometimes you can 
misread your audience mm -hmm. the same way I speak it does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know. But that's an as I guess that's a quality you gain over years. Uh huh. You, you know, know, you you mentioned you mentioned changing inflection. Yeah. And uh, there's a concept that I teach in my classes called significant tone. Yeah. In other words, in from the African American community, like uh, if you went to a black Baptist or black Pentecostal church, and you got up to sing Amazing Grace, and you sang it straight, and I heard this happen in the church one time, girl got up and sang it straight because she was worried about, oh, what will people think? And one of the deacons touched her on the arm and said, look, baby, we already know the melody. Yeah. Now, now uh, convince me yeah. that you know what grace is. Yeah, you know, is come that. on, do something with that melody, you yeah, know. Yeah, it's a certain authority <laughs> that you have, you, you have to have. You can hear that, well, in most of you, <clears throat> I guess we would call, uh, well, the English language has words for all these things, I, in, indigenous cultures, I guess, uh, country and western music. Uh, the. The lyrics to their songs are so basic and down to earth. You, you can't miss the message. Uh -huh. Then you got to do do something with it. Uh -huh. I mean, um, and then when they add the inflections and the tones that they use, you, you know, you know what they mean. You know, it's <laughs> it's just real, and it's I, I guess it's almost like. Sometimes almost like the blues, really, because they use the same words. I mean, like, like you said, y'all, and, and certain words that let you know that we are from the same place. Uh-huh. The sense of community. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was thinking of the blues for a tremendous emotional vehicle Yeah. where the subjective qualities have to be exalted over the object of design because it ain't but 12 bars. Well, that's right. That's right, and uh, and as you said before, it, it, they emotion is first, and with jazz, uh, in a lot of instances, the musicianship comes first. Right. Now, where my thing is is where I, where I try to bring emotion and music, musicianship together. That's about where, where I am. Can you describe to some of our players that would be watching this what kind of thought process? Uh, are you thinking chords and, and scales and all that when you play? Did your uh, did your music education? Did you have to kind of combine that with your yeah. instinct and come up with a? Yeah, I had to come up with a formula. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. And basically, with me, emotion won out. There's a little, <coughs> when you get into that, it's about 60 40 going in the way of emotion. Uh. <coughs> Excuse me, but um, I would say, too, that some of the musicianship you acquire over the years too is inbred. I mean, so, sooner or later it becomes in your subconscious. Mm -hmm. And sometimes your musicianship will not allow you to do certain things. And where you gotta do that, you gotta somehow break those rules. Uh huh. Uh huh. I was like going to ask. I was going to ask you that. <coughs> Did you find yourself in 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 try after you had studied technically? Mm -hmm. in trying to capture and define your voice the way you wanted to hear it, did you find that you almost had to break rules? Yeah. Well, that's what jazz and music is about, really. Is, uh, music is, <coughs> excuse me, music is learning the rules and then breaking them. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the whole process. Let me just uh, uh, ask you to say, uh, you said you found yourself breaking some of the rules. Mm -hmm. um, how did that sit with the people you were studying with? Did they understand that you had to pursue that? No, oh, no, I didn't do that then. Though. I sort of kept the two separate. Um, when I was studying, I was studying, and then when I was playing, I was playing. It was two different things. Yeah. Uh, 
And then somewhere along the way, they just, or they were on a collision course. And then that's when, because um, for a time, you have to play within the rules. Uh, you got to know them first. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but that's fine, that's fine. You know, and then find your own voice, which every musician goes through. Mm -hmm. Was there a point in, in your uh, career where you knew you were going to be a musician or something happened for you to, or was it something that I always knew I was going to be a musician? No, I didn't always know yeah. I was going to be a musician. I just, just, it just happened. It just evolved that way. Uh -huh. But I was, the more I got into it, the more I liked yeah. it. So that was, that was just the way it happened. Tell us about what some of your earlier experiences were in trying to get into the jazz field. And was it a, was it a tough, uh, yeah, yeah, it was sort of tough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, I did something that very few people do. I formed a group immediately. I only, I didn't play around with a lot of people. I just started a group. Uh-huh. So that helped me a lot, too, the, because I didn't have to play within anybody else's framework. I could, mm -hmm. I started right out in mine. So... It was rather hard, but that's what I did. Mm -hmm. You seem to like the organ trio format tr too. Is that? Oh yeah, yeah, I like I like the organ, and uh, but I use piano and bass. I've been using piano mm -hmm. and bass now for about eight nine years. Yeah. But I still record a lot with the organs mm -hmm. and piano. Oh, I like recording a lot of different formats, a lot of different. You know, I, I feel like that that Hammond B three sound. Just the sound of the instrument yeah. is the perfect bridge between jazz, rhythm and blues, and gospel. That's right. <laughs> Just the sound of the instrument. Yeah, well, people, too, associate it with the church because you hear an organ in the church, and then you bring that to jazz, and with, with the blues sound and the blues licks, and it, it's a perfect sound. And then it has a sustaining quality. Uh -huh where, you, you know, you can hold that chord. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I like about it, too. It has a nice sustaining quality. And then the organ bass line is another thing, where it's uh, sort of a thumping sound. <laughs> yeah, doom, doom, doom. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Not yeah. going to move them, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's a nice dancing sound, too. Uh -huh. you yeah. know, it gives a big, heavy beat. Uh-huh. So it's really conducive to a lot of things. Yeah. Tell us about some of the great organ players you worked with. Oh, boy, I worked with them. I worked with them all. Yeah. Yeah, Charlie Erlin, uh, Jack McDuff, uh, Sonny Phillips, uh, Joey DeFrancesco. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. Groove Holmes, Holmes, Johnny Hammond Smith. Yeah, I can't even, yeah, I've worked yeah. with a lot of organ players. And uh, they were all good. So, oh, this was the greatest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also worked with uh, Jimmy Smith, yeah. who is the king. So I worked with a lot of them. Great. What's it been like uh, visiting? different parts of the country and other countries. Uh, you've done a lot of traveling and do you notice a, oh, yeah. a difference on how people relate to your particular brand oh. of music? Oh, well I'm well received everywhere. Yeah. Um, uh, surprisingly, you know, a lot of places they haven't heard, uh, they've heard it, but I guess they haven't been really aware of the, the, my kind of thing being related to having a lot of blues in it. You know, a lot of people ask, you know, well, how do you play like that? Or what, what kind of sound would you call that? Or what sort of style is that? But um, I, I'm pretty well received, mm -hmm. pretty well received, yeah. And um, in the States, it's, 
a nice audience. I, I, you know, I love the audiences everywhere. A lot of people see a lot of difference in the audience, but a, you know, a good audience is a good audience. Mm -hmm. I got them in the states and and um, abroad. But one thing I know too is traveling. A lot of people really don't know how beautiful America is. Oh, I've never seen the country. Um, that doesn't have anything to do with music, but uh, I say culturally speaking, we really don't know how beautiful the country is. I mean, to see all the sights, there's a lot there. A lot of people spend a lot of time going to other countries mm -hmm. and think they should see their country first. And In other words, some people say they always think the grass is greener when you find out, but you find out it's the angle of the sunlight. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah. You know, I wanted to see if ask you to bring that bring up that bring that thought home too. Is, you know, uh, I find so much beauty in sounds that are produced in the African American community, though they are not in any music method book. You know, I've never picked up a music method book and have someone tell you how to sing like Aretha Franklin? Oh, well, you won't find that. <laughs> no, you won't find that. Um, well, the, the one thing I can tell you that everywhere I go, I hear American music. In every country in the world, mm -hmm. there'll be some form of American music. So I, I was in Germany last week and I was just amazed. And um, they were playing some of the uh, the R and B and contemporary music, and there was you know Barry White and and all that. I said, man, I was glad to hear that. You know, glad to hear that stuff. You know, and I say I was in the department store. They were just playing all kind of <laughs> the Manhattans and. You know, Nita Baker and all these people. And then I went to another place, they played Hard Silver in the airport. Was, wow. They had all jazz, you know, Hard Silver, Miles Davis, John Coltrane. In the airport? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, only on, just piped Great. in. Yeah. And uh, then I went, yeah, in the hotel, they had, uh, they had uh, you know, contemporary country and western music crossing with contemporary R&B music and I said man so it's just amazing and then it's amazing too to go back home and see how much people don't appreciate it yeah mm, mm. it's like our greatest export you know yeah <laughs> yeah and uh, we just take it for granted is there something that can be done to uh, bring greater appreciation for the arts in general and for jazz in particular, to the uh, to bring it to, to to bear, bring it to the mind of the the American public to say this is something that we have that started here that we can cherish and and be more proud of and support in a greater way. Well, you know, I don't even limit it to music or art. Um, I think we as Americans, and I, this has nothing to do with jazz, or, as you said, you said art and jazz in particular, I, so I won't misquote you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think uh, we've all hit, uh, this is just my opinion, uh, sort of a danger zone, uh, We've got a crossroads where everybody's got to make decisions. And I think it all goes down to education. The whole key to everything is education. And everybody should be entitled to, to an education. You just can't educate a few and then leave the leave the rest out to swim or uh, hanging in the wind. Everything to me goes back to education. Uh, we don't 
teach geography in the schools anymore. So a kid only knows about his immediately area, sometimes his own, own block. Mm. I mean, you're taking New York City when people haven't even been to a museum, and you got more museums there than anywhere in the world on the face of the earth. Mm. You got more culture in Manhattan Island, and you take 90% of the people, and that's an elaborate, I'm elaborating because I don't know, I'm not a statistician, you know. But most of the people haven't been to a museum, a uh, play, uh, uh, a ballet, uh, anything. So you get everybody computer literate and then send them way across the world to Japan. They know nothing about the culture. Hmm. So then you find us in trouble with a nation. Sure. Because nobody knows the culture. So, hey, I mean, <clears throat> now we've got a, a trade war with them. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and we don't even understand their culture. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's crazy. You take geography out, you take arts, all the arts are out. That's the only way you can ex expand your mind is through art. They take that out. They even take sports out. They just take everything out. And those are the ones they think that people don't need, and those are the ones you need the most. Mm. One has to do with your physical well-being, one has to do with your mental well-being, mm -hmm. and they're gone. Mm. It's crazy. So nobody knows nothing about any. Nobody knows anything about anybody. So you wind up taking everything for granted, your art. Um, I would dare say in America, people even take their freedom for granted. Mm. You know, we don't. We don't know what it is to be free. I mean. I mean, really, when you really look at it. So we can't even understand an artist expanding, you know, going to war, breaking barriers. You know, I mean, we, we do, we take it for granted. Yeah, and I, you know, I wouldn't even eliminate us, but we travel. So we do know, you know, you go to other countries and you see the, the, the limitations and the citizenship and everything, then it hits home. Mm -hmm. But how many people have the opportunity to travel? So those that don't, you get it through education. And then it's not there. So we don't educate in the formative years, then we send them off to college, and then they see all these things that's just banging your head up a brick mm. wall. <laughs> it's crazy. It's madness. So that's why I, I say, um, that we're at a crossroads and people have to, we as adults have to make some big decisions here on what we actually want. So, especially now in the wake of Oklahoma City, now everybody's talking about wanting to give up some of the freedoms just to have a little peace. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, which I wonder is dangerous, that. you know, so, and it all affects art in one way or other. I, I was going to ask you, know. you that because you know, I, I'm of the opinion, I just want to get you, get uh, a thought from you on this. I'm of the opinion that I don't think if the person who planted that bomb the same morning before he did that had sat down and listened to a Mozart symphony or a good album side by Ellington, I don't think he could have put that bomb. That's what I was talking about, getting everybody computer, everybody's becoming computer literate with no compassion. Because there's no art. I, I, I went to a movie, I saw a movie, Martin Sheen was in it. I, could, I don't remember what it was. But it was about, he was making a statement about teachers, and one teacher liking Shakespeare and Mozart. And, and Martin Sheen has to say, well, I'm not worried about him, because as long as he does that, he'll have compassion. Mm. You know, he was talking about a scientist, a guy who was really brilliant in science, but he still listened to Mozart. And mm -hmm. He says, you don't have to worry about him, mm -hmm. because he'll always be compassionate. See, and, and uh, as long as we have balanced individuals and a balanced approach to uh, 
to life and education. I mean, it, it still requires our science and math students to study art. Then there'll always be compassion around. Well, nobody will get overboard in one thing as so-called a, a specialized society where we have people who just do this. That's mm -hmm. all they do. You mm -hmm. know, like somebody's content to stay with a computer like 12 or 14 hours and really just have a ball, man. That's, there's something wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> there's something wrong with that. Yeah. When they don't care about going out here and some music or anything, you know, I can mm -hmm. just, whatever is happening, I can get it out of my computer. Well, but I think technology has, you know, it's always a double-edged sword mm -hmm. because it brings all this wealth of information at your fingertips, but at the same time, it makes uh, people less likely to explore things on their own. Yeah. To go out, as you say, and to see live live art, to yeah. see it being done by real people. And yeah, because so I, was, I was at a candy, candy counter one day, and I was buying some candy, and <coughs> I asked the girl, she said, well, what would you want, a half or a quart? And I said, no, just give me an eighth. And she was bewildered. And the computer would just wouldn't. And it was so sad until I bailed her out. I just said, well, let me have a half a pound. I, I, mm. I almost cried I, just to see. And she was such a beautiful, friendly child and didn't know anything without, that com without the calculator. It was just that sad. That's the danger of technology. And uh, when you have to rely on a machine, uh, that's, that's, how do you survive? You know, like you call somewhere and say, well, they say our computers are down. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's helpless. Mm -hmm. I mean, the lights went out in Newark Airport and it threw the whole country off. Mm. Man, do we need that? I mean, do, do we really need that? And, you know, and you've got musicians now writing music with computers, you know. <laughs> the guys say, well, I'll just go in the room and I got my computer. Nah, I don't, <clears throat> I don't need all of that. You know, there's sometimes, some sometimes, you know, you're glad your time is almost over, man, because, I, you know, I, I don't need all this stuff. I say, right. man, you know, I'll just there's some pass things, on all of there's that. There's some things you cannot digitally sample. Uh, I would just like to ask you, as we be as we wrap up our interview here, if you would have a word of encouragement or insight uh, to younger college age students, uh, some involved in music, some perhaps at a liberal arts college, uh, you give them some insights just about the nature of jazz or how to listen and appreciate the music. See. In 25 words or less. You know, after, you, after all of this, you really stumped me. <laughs> <laughs> I was just success, just success that there's so many facets of it, is to go out and just hear artists that are appearing in your local area and get, um, as I said, everybody should take a course in basic music appreciation. Do they still have those in school? Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, I think everybody should really be required to take take that. And that way, I think too, uh, via the classroom, they have a better chance of hearing it. Because I, my my experience is that when they're exposed to it, they like it, any form of culture. And I also would say that um, one shouldn't cast. One, well, one sort of musical way, people just try to expand their appreciation. There's nothing wrong with hip hop, nothing wrong with rap, nothing wrong with none of it. Just that there are other alternatives at different times, other music was served with different preference. And uh, I listen to it all and enjoy it all. Just want you to expand. And you don't have to throw one away 
I go to see the symphony, that doesn't mean I'm ever going to listen to jazz again. If I go to hear jazz, it doesn't mean I'm not going to hear a symphony or hear this. It just means that more expansion co contributes to you being a better balanced person. And that's what my thing is about, balance. Sounds good. And get that education. This has been uh, an interview for the Hamilton College Jazz Archives with Houston Person. Thank you.